Well, good morning and thank you very much for joining us. I am Yori Holani. Hope you had a great weekend. Okay, off to work uh, quite early. Our guest this morning uh, is coming to us from our Buja studio, Indy Kato, a spokesperson of the Obidati Presidential Campaign Council. Uh, a fine morning to you, Indy. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Good morning. Me. Indeed, our pleasure. Okay, um, the election is, you know, so to speak, just round the corner, and um, all the parties are working. Yes, Certainly, it is. Uh, it is the case with, uh, you know, Labour as well, with the uh, presidential team of uh, Obi Dati. Uh, that's why it's the Obi Dati Presidential Campaign Council. Um, even at this stage, you launched recently some sort of an app um, that I'll be seeking to learn about. Uh, because it's connected with um, the, the grassroots project of your party. Maybe I should start from there. Um, well, it, it seems we, we understand grassroots, uh, but tell us about you making a project of it in your party. Well, I mean, you know, we have, we have so far run a very decentralized campaign where it's a come one, come all situation and anybody from anywhere can participate. So this app is just really trying to bring everybody together on one platform to organize better towards the elections. Like you said, you know, we have next to no time left. Uh, I think less than two, less than three weeks um, left for this election to happen. And it's imperative that we create a platform where everybody can come together and organize towards the elections. And that's what the town hall, what the town hall app is. OK, it's a town hall app. OK. Um, you know, maybe this is uh, as good a time as any to speak about it. Uh, people think rightly or wrongly that you have uh, a deep presence on social media. Uh, whatever the feelings are about that uh, online. And um, it's interesting to hear that probably can't be denied, but it's also interesting to hear that um, you're working on the grassroots uh, level as well, because the argument has been, uh, well, maybe argument is too strong a word, but the point has been made that, look, in the grassroots where the power really lies, they don't have access to uh, uh, the internet and uh, the, all the online uh, campaigns that uh, uh, Labour Party, you know, and the others, by the way, you know, really rely upon. Uh, first of all, two things in there. Number one, most of the support of Labour Party is online. And um, how is this going to interface with that? I would, I would like to correct that notion. Most of the support of Labour Party is not online. Labour Party has support online and offline, and it is that offline support that is bleeding, on, bleeding into the online space. That online support is something that people are really looking for, other political parties are looking for on the large scale that Labour Party has, and they do not have it. Now, to say that that is the only... Um, support or that is most of the support that Labour Party has will be false. Look, at the end of the day, people that you see are, 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 are online are actual human beings. These are actual Nigerians. These Nigerians also belong in the grassroots. Many people shooting videos do not shoot videos, do not show us videos of themselves from the city, from the city areas. Many of them shoot from the rural areas. I was privileged to travel to the southeast, for example, uh, this new year, and I remember seeing there in that village, you know, many people are also not on social media talking about these issues but right there in the grassroots there in the southeast i didn't even see you know when people we can't see posters and say i did not see posters but every single person i met except just one man was a labor party supporter and that's what this is that you know what we have a lot of support online and we have a lot of support offline and if this if this didn't matter we would not have you know governors and and the speaker of the house of representatives struggling to gain that online support right now from the apc after seeing what is happening with their own campaign it means that these spaces matter and another important thing to note is that the support from online actually trickles the conversation the conversation online in fact, um, influences the, the conversation on grassroots level, and that's very important to note. You know, we can't we can't say that oh, many people from the grassroots are not aware of what we are talking about. They are aware. They are aware of the issues. The same issues affect them. And if you go to any grassroots area in Nigeria and you talk to any Nigerian, it's the same issue we are talking about here that they are talking about down there. So online support does not mean that we do not have. Um, uh, offline support. In fact, I would say that online support is directly representative of offline support, and Labour Party has the most of both. Mm. 
Well, uh, you, you've given part of the answer to what my next question was going to be. I was going to ask you to sort of uh, um, uh, mm -hmm. evaluate the uh, grassroots uh, support which you know you think um, labor has it's coming down to name recognition isn't it uh, that is to say your party name and indeed the name of your um, you know of your candidates uh, among other things uh, and of course we need to go to, probably we'll be going to the projects and what it is that uh, Obi and for that matter Dati uh, have done by well you know how it works and so that's why people that have made the mm -hmm. point probably made it that look you look at all the front runners, you know, they don't seem to, they, they would think that the others have a name recognition, but you are just saying, I mean, you are implying in there that um, no less so in your case. Am I right in making that assumption? Of course, Peter Obi has name recognition. He does. I mean, this is someone that if he just turns up in a place, people are rushing up to him. What better name recognition than that? When we went to my well, village, well, Kafanchan, in fact, we went to the village, Kafanchan in southern Kaduna. Kafanchan is where my father comes from. Kogoro is where my mother comes from. And we went to both villages. And you should see the support. People were trekking between local governments with Peter Obi's vehicle. So for us to say, you know, uh, this name recognition is not, no, that, that is northern Nigeria, not west. People know him there. Many places where Peter Obi goes to, people are flooding. They are showing emotional investments in his campaign. So if it is name mm -hmm. recognition, I think more than anyone at this point, Peter Obi does have name recognition. And it's not okay. just name recognition. People are passionate about this man, and it's something that we need to note. Okay. Um, maybe, thank you. Uh, maybe name recognition, I could have phrased it uh, differently because I would be one of the you know, first to yeah. also admit that. The name Peter Obi. It does, you know, resonate uh, up and down the country. But I really meant to say, uh, people might say, we can see what other candidates have done in their past, and so you're probably going to be concerned uh, to show that you also have the goods to put next to what other people are, you know, putting out there please, as a to, key point. Please, you have to take that again. Please, can you take that okay. again? Sorry, you went off for a bit. Uh, okay. Yeah, uh, first of all, I, I think well, what I was saying was that it's not so much name recognition per se, uh, so my bad, uh, because mm -hmm. everybody does know uh, about Peter Obi, but in terms of what has been, yeah. what he has uh, by way of CV, uh, talking politically now, uh, what it is that he's done, seeing as that seems to be what the politicians are now saying, that look, I've done this, I've done that, I've done this, I've done that. Uh, so I don't know uh, what you think, uh, because I'm, I'm relating all of this back to the grassroots, the people, the so-called, these maybe unsophisticated folks who don't have data and uh, who must be met one-on-one. -on -one. You've got to knock on their door or whatever, uh, that kind of a thing. Um, do you think they also have a good notion of what your candidate uh, has done in the past that will stand him in very good stead in the next few weeks? You know, you know the... the, the yeah, the, the thing, and this, this is the thing, like Peter Obi keeps facing this in the media and keeps facing this in, you know, upper class political conversations as to, uh, you know, the experience, to see a political neophyte, and he's not. You know, this is the same thing that happened when he came out to run for governor of Anambra State. You know, career politicians kept saying, who is he, where is he coming from? We've been in this system for so long. Sorry, my, my, my earpiece. Um, We've been in this system for so long. Who is this fellow? Where is he coming from? And does he think he can just come and bulldoze his way? But he did that and he won the governorship of Anandra State. And he won it twice. He served two terms, right? And he understood this system very well and ran that system well. So I think it's also based on what he did in Anambra that people are really passionate about. Because people who are experiencing him in Anambra are the biggest preachers of what he has done, you know, and, and the need to vote for this man. Many people have come out to say, look, when I was in secondary school, this is what he did for us. In healthcare, this is what he did for the marketplace. All of this, this is what he did. And to have that kind of testimony from your state, to be so widespread, as accepted, um, widely accepted in your state is really a great thing. Uh, we can't really say that somebody who has been the governor, two-time governor of the state, is, is, is not politically experienced. Come on, I don't think that that is something that would point to. He has been a two-time governor, and even when he was, in, he was governor, on a different political party, Jonathan still made him serve in his economic council in, uh, on his team uh, during the Jonathan administration. It just speaks to how experienced this man is and how valuable his skills and, and knowledge is. So I, I don't think, I don't think so. And I also think that, you know, his skills transcend beyond 
career politics. This is an astute businessman, a man who has sat on the board of many important companies, including banks, you know, superstores and all of that. And I don't think that we should throw that away. We need a well-rounded individual to be president of Nigeria, and Peter will be his one. Uh, we can't just say that, you know, or one who has, who has run the political circle. And I think, you know, when we look at that, it's, 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 it's also, you know, not really good for the conversation when you say that. Because a, a lot of the times our political system is, is very rent seeking, you know. It's, it's, not, it's, it's not as sophisticated as it should be. So we need someone who has been in this system, been in other systems, and can bring their experience from other sectors and apply to the political sector, apply to governance, and that's what we need. And the good thing is Peter Obi has the best of both worlds. He has functioned in places where, you know what, your wealth and other things should be backed by enterprise. He has functioned in spaces where it is your knowledge, it's your skills that work for you, and he's bringing that to politics. And I think that that should be a plus. We shouldn't just look and say, oh, has this person been in politics? politics his entire life. If he has not been in politics his entire life, then he does not qualify. I think that it's, it is an advantage that Peter Obi has experience in other spaces, has experience in politics, and he can merge the two for governance. Okay. Well, during, last week, you know that you, poli you, you political guys are uh, in the political parties, if not before, certainly in this period, mm -hmm. you got your ears to the ground. And you would have heard Governor El Rufaya of uh, mm -hmm. uh, Kaduna uh, speak about your candidate by name is why I bring it up now. Um, you know, he, he had used words that lead to uh, the conclusion from him that um, he, he's not a serious contender. He spoke about uh, percentages, characterized him in a particular way. Uh, we, it, there's a sense in which you can say it's all politics, but since all politicians have their audiences, um, give me your commentary on uh, government, uh, Governor El Rufai's uh, uh, categorization and assessment of your candidate. If, I mean, there's one reason uh, El Rufai came on TV, and that's because his candidate is threatened, uh, and the person he supports and his political career as a result of that is threatened, and he had, he had run to TV damage control. Now, if part of that damage control, you know, if in that damage control, sorry, I can't, can't really hear you, so I don't know if you can hear me, but if, if, if in that damage control he mentioned Peter Obi's name, then it means that Peter Obi is the front runner candidate. If somebody runs to TV and feels that they need to defend, they need to say things, they need to, you know, be out there so that their candidate is saved from the quagmire that the candidate is currently in and their political party is saved, and he calls somebody who is on his own, doing his own campaign towards a better Nigeria, it means that he feels threatened. There are so many other people running for office and uh, running for president in Nigeria, so many other candidates running for president in Nigeria, and he didn't make notes, he, he did not mention any of them to put down their candidacy. So if he found out Peter will be, it means that there's something there, especially the fact that, you know, especially with the fact that the reason he was on TV in the first place was damage control, was to save face and the fact that his, 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 his party is facing internal crisis at the moment. Hmm. Okay, um, I'll, I'll return to it perhaps because in the meantime, I have Mr. George on the and, line. And, He's and, uh, you know, yeah, yes. Carry on, I, please. I, sorry, before you go, I, I think I want to I want to point out that the statement El Rufai made with respect to Christian communities in Northern Nigeria is a, is an insult and is beneath anyone of any political standing to do that kind of thing. These are major voting populations in the north, people who have faced a lot of oppression and are trying to survive. He should know better than doing that, especially in Kaduna State, that is a very heterogeneous society, and you know people come under constant attacks. And we've not really seen him come to speak for the people of Kaduna like that, and then to come out and refer to them as Christian enclaves. I consider that an insult, and I think that you know it should be disregarded. No part of Nigeria should be regarded or talked talked about like that. Okay, indeed. As I was saying earlier, I've got to bring on a, a viewer now. Um, Mr. George has called in from Lagos. Good morning, Mr. George. You got an observation or question for Indy? Uh, well, an observation. Good morning, uh, Uncle Yori. Good morning, sir. A, a quick observation. My, the observation I am going to make is in connection with the attitude of the opposition party to this upcoming election. It is clear, Uncle Yori, very, very clear, or even the blind that these opposition uh, parties are organizing with certain bad elements everywhere to make sure that this, this election does not hold. That is what I can see. But they should remember that they cannot win if there is no country to govern. 
and that we who vote them, we the voters, we are using this to see who is who in our country among those that are trying to lead us. What is their character? What is their aim? If an opponent of yours is ahead or leading in a campaign, bringing him down, is that the way to bring yourself up? Does that portray that this man, if he comes to power, he will do what is good for the country? Selfishness and betrayal and distrust and cowardness are things that I am seeing. And that, look at the statement, Uncle Yoru, look at the statement Peter B made, look at the statement uh, Adiku made about the sufferings of people who, are, who have money in the bank but they cannot see the money to use. They don't have the courage to blame the governor of Central Bank and his clique. They are telling us it is slight inconvenience. Slight inconvenience when you see people Okay. Um, I think I got enough of that before I lost that call. Uh, Indy, did you also hear that caller? Yes, I did. Yes, I did. Oh, okay. Uh, we, we, uh, please go ahead if you would like to comment. I mean, I, I think what we're facing is a national crisis, and I, I have personally suffered from it too. I mean, I had to go to the market last week, uh, Saturday on Saturday, and I know the hell I went through. I had to buy Nera. I, I've never experienced that kind of thing my entire life, using the Nera to buy the Nera. I don't think any country would have experienced this kind of thing. And it is right, of course, to call that out, the suffering of the Nigerian people. But, you know, to jump the internal crisis and, and, and the mudslinging in the APC and just jump and say, oh, it's the opposition parties that are fueling this. I honestly don't know what the caller wants, wants the opposition parties to do. Um, at this point, it is right to say, look, you need to do something about the situation. Nigerians are going through a lot and, you know, there is that. And, and the comments made by, my, by, by our candidate, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. I think that at the end of the day, APC is going through its internal crisis and it should face itself. It should face what it thinks the cabal is doing. They should go back and forth. We've been seeing them all over social media, all over the news media, throwing mud at themselves. But to extend it, I mean, is this same thing Erufai came to blame certain cabals or, 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 or the presidency for in the media? I don't, I don't see how people who are not in power should be blamed for this. Labour Party is not currently in power. What we are seeking to do is to enter government and bring Nigeria back from the brink. And right now we are not in there. So I don't know how we are coming into the conversation about the NERA. You know, it, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not Labour Party. It's the ruling party that has messed this up. It's the ruling party that is giving Nigeria a really hard time with respect to our standard of living and continues to throw very difficult, impossible policies at us. And any right-thinking person should point straight to the ruling party when things like this go wrong. Okay, let me take another call. This time, it's uh, Mr. Lalekon in the UK. Good morning to you, Mr. Lalekon. Yeah, good morning to you, Uncle Yori. Good morning, sir. Please um, go ahead. Is good it morning. a... Good morning, sir. Thank you for the, thank you for the opportunity. Sure. Uh, what I just want to say is... Um, it's very, this election is very crucial to us. And I believe we need somebody who are very, have good antecedents, who can put our country in in the right form. Right? To me, it's very easy. The Tinubu Obi Hatiku, one way or the other, they are lead. The, con I mean, the state, or for example, I think I've been a vice before, or B was a governor before, like twice, I assured you, Tinubu. But we know the antecedent of each one of them. To me, like what the question you asked that lady you are speaking to, that what is the antecedent of his candidate? It's very easy. What is he achieved in Anambra? Why the same Anambra people? Need to migrate to Lagos State. Even the same candidate is campaign, she's campaigning for, she he lives in Lagos State. So to me, it's clear, very obvious for us to know that the right person we need, how that we like it or not, is Tinubu. But for people, for Lagos to attract a lot of people to come all over Nigeria, that is very clear. 
know that about it. They can say anything about him. Is this is that? That is political. That is political campaign. You know. Okay. And because the man is even bold enough to say something about the central bank, what is happening. Does he say the same thing, or does the article say the same thing? The answer is no. So to me, Nubu is the right candidate for me. Thank you. All right, then. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Alaleko, for calling in from the UK. But our subject matter is really uh, seeking to understand uh, Labour Party's uh, uh, grassroots project. Uh, it's a newsworthy thing, and I wanted to try and understand it. But nevertheless, I'm sure Indy is up to the task. You went where you went, and I'm sure Indy is waiting for you there. Uh, <laughs> and Ambrarians, all of, all of them are in Lagos. If, if, if Peter Obi had done such a fantastic job, wouldn't they all be home? As I think, you know, that's a crude distillation of his point. Um, of course, uh, first things first, not all Anambra people are in Lagos. Um, Igbo people are nomadic, especially because of the way they handle their business. They are everywhere in and out of Nigeria. So let's not just point to Lagos and say Anambrarians are in Lagos. Uh, number two, you know, I'm actually glad that I get to speak on this issue because it's, it's this fallacy that has been spread and spread, you know, they keep bringing it up in the conversation. But Lagos is the financial capital, the economic capital of Nigeria. Are you saying that Nigerians are not free to travel and live and work anywhere within Nigeria, especially if a place has the major ports? And that is the draw. This has the major ports in Nigeria. Of course, businesses will gravitate towards that area. So are you saying that some Nigerians do not, do not qualify? Tinubu did not make Lagos the major port in Nigeria. He did not make Lagos the economic capital of Nigeria. It is what it is. It's like asking why, you know, people from Southern Kaduna, where I come from, are in Abuja. Abuja is the capital of Nigeria. People are going to come here. People are going to gravitate towards these places. These places will be saturated with some certain level of investment, some certain level of development that would make people come to these areas to engage in businesses in this place. But let's also talk about Anambra. I mean, let's look at how he took Anambra to number one in, 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 in education. Let's look at what he did with healthcare, you know, re re resuscitating a lot of these hospitals that had become moribund, you know, his work with primary healthcare centers in Anambra State, his work with his donations of over 500 vehicles to security, um, security personnel towards ensuring security in Anambra State, helping to eradicate armed robbery in the last um in his last term in office. I mean, these are so many things. If you're looking at Peter Obi's antecedents, and, and one of the things I like about it, if you attend any event with Peter Obi when he's speaking, when he finishes and he's talking to dignitaries, he shares his CV. He takes his CV around. Look at the things I have done. When I was in governor, when I was governor, I was doubling the economic council for Nigeria. When I was governor, this is these were the statistics. These are the awards that came to Anambra State. So please let's let's stop this. Igbo people are going to continue to do business in and out of Nigeria, as 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 with other people in Nigeria. To be honest, they are not the only ones. Yoruba people are going to do business in and out of Nigeria. Northerners are going to do business in and out of Nigeria. I can't imagine going to a country and hearing people saying, "Why is Dangote having a plant in my country? Does he not have a country?" People are free to do business anywhere they want to do business. And this place is the economic capital of the country. People will gravitate towards there. But also, let's remember that Anambra has its own industries. You know, there's a, there's, there's, there's a motor assembly plant in Anambra. There are so many things happening there. There are so many businessmen that you have not even heard of. You have not even heard of doing business there and succeeding there. So let's, 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 let's kill that argument, please. Okay, let me bring on Mike, who has been waiting to join the program in Sweden. Good morning, Mike. Hello, Uncle Yodo. Good morning to you. Good morning, sir. Go ahead, please. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning, Indy. How are you? I hope you are cool. I'm very fine, thank you. Yeah. Thank Yodo, you. I want to ask you a question. When did when did when did Bola Hamed become the governor of Lagos State? As your last caller said, why would his people migrate to the to Lagos State? See that court, where he is he calling from? Is he in Nigeria? He's not in Nigeria. I'm in Sweden. I'm not from Sweden. I left home to come to Sweden. So when people call and make some certain statements, you should shun them. People migrated from different places to different places. Well, I'm to become the governor of Lagos State from 1999. So before people migrated from their place to Lagos State, Lagos State has been there. So let us not make this a particular something. Let us focus on the issue base. That's just what I want to say, please. Thank you. All right, then. Thank you very much. Um, well, uh, what we're talking about this morning, at least that's what we started off uh, in
Ndikato and I, presidential, um, I mean, the spokesperson for the Obidati Presidential Campaign Council, was to understand the project, the uh, grassroots project. But then, wherever people take it to, as I was saying, in the Isdale, she's waiting, and she probably will respond, uh, respond appropriately. Indy, I'll just take a break now, a uh, very short break. We'll be right back, and we'll continue with this conversation, and also uh, continue taking your calls. Stay with us, please. Okay, welcome back. Our guest is Indy Kato. She's a spokesperson of the Obidati Presidential Campaign Council, and um, she's talking with us um, uh, about uh, the party's grassroots project, but then it is the political season, and uh, people are calling in, and uh, they have other areas you know, of the whole enterprise that they want to talk about. And um, she hasn't uh, rebuffed uh, any uh, observation or question so far. So I, I think we're still good. Now, let me return to um, the governor of Kaduna State and his um, uh, statements as it related to um, your uh, candidate and uh, his categorization of his of his uh, chances. Um, this whole crucial business of every politician who is going to win needs 25 percent in uh, two thirds of the states of the federation. Um, it was his assertion that it wasn't going to happen in the northern area, and uh, you've addressed that, you know, a bit. Uh, but would you like to return to the point, since he was being categorical, that the North, there's no way they're going to go with P2B. But here we are talking about the party's grassroots project. Um, there is grassroots. There is a grassroots. Is there a sense in which Governor, you know, uh, uh, El Rufai uh, doesn't know anything about the grassroots and especially the fact that you are focused on it on a grassroots uh, as, as a project and that this might probably um, be one of the reasons why you are as optimistic as you are and perhaps it's his own lack of knowledge of the work that you're doing in the grassroots that is uh, leading to the kind of uh, assertions he's making that oh, we can't cut it in the north. No, one would not say Erufai lacks knowledge. I would tell you that. But one would say, and I would say categorically, that he's being very dishonest. Um, Erufai knows the North very well. He knows that Northern Nigeria is not a monolith. But it serves his political interests and serves what he wants to achieve, to keep pro projecting Northern Nigeria as one place that has just one kind of people, you know, and then, you know, try to put down other kinds of people in Northern Nigeria. And that is exactly what he came on TV to attempt to do. Northern Nigeria is not a monolith. There are so many people. It's such a heterogeneous society. And as you have seen with Peter Obi's campaigns, when he goes to places, look, there's next to no mobilization done and people come out in large numbers. The other thing is he's going to places that have largely been abandoned during campaigns. So to point it as, so these are just small enclaves. No, these are places that people look to for votes, but do not even bother to engage. And Peter Obi has changed the way in which campaigning is being done. We are beginning to see other candidates copy him and try to go to all of these places too, because there are places that candidates feel entitled these major political parties feel entitled to getting votes from, but not necessarily, you know, feel the urge to go there and engage these people. They just, they just engage the political actors and feel that, you know what, the political actors in this place, you know, the people who are part of our rent-seeking system in these places will go back home and tell the people to vote accordingly and people will vote accordingly. But them around, the people are on the side with Peter Obi. And Peter Obi has engaged these people. And when you see when he goes to these places and the way the, the people engage him, you would know that, you know what, these votes are going to come out. And I think he's being faced with that ex existential crisis. He's being faced with that reality that, for, you know, this election is going to come out that, you know, there's so many parts of northern Nigeria. Northern Nigeria, not, not, northerners do not just wake up and think in one way. Northerners think about their future, the, their own personal interests and how things are going to move the north forward. I think he's being faced with this reality that is making Erufai speak out like this. And like I said before, he, he ran to TV to do damage control. We have not really heard from him since the beginning of the campaign. And um, here he is speaking now and crying from TV station to TV station. He should tell you that this person knows that his campaign the candidate he supports is, is largely under threat and there's a need for him to do something and I think it's with this he's speaking and it is with this he's projecting all of these insecurities, it's with this he's, he's, he's projecting all of this dishonesty and, and I think he knows, he knows the truth, Erufai knows the truth, he's a knowledgeable man, he's my governor, he's a knowledgeable man, he knows the truth but he's very dishonest. Okay, um, now another key point that all politicians are speaking about is go get your PVC, speaking to the electorate. Um, 
give me your assessment of how well that is going in your party um, because um, you know it's, it's, it's crucial and um, we've heard about some people saying that they have difficulties uh, others not so much you, wherever the PVC is being you know uh, given to the people uh, you see a very large crowd and it would seem that um, in certain areas um, uh, labor uh, supporters, you know, they sort of uh, mass the place. Uh, give me your assessment of how well that campaign is going uh, to your uh, obedience, as they are referred to. That's, that ended uh, yesterday, the 5th, right? Yesterday was the 5th of, uh, of, of February. That ended yesterday. And, yes. um, you know, there's, there's no party that has pushed so much for for PVC collection, for, for registration to vote and for PVC collection as Labour Party has, especially the young people in Labour Party, I think at this point we need to applaud them for all they have done. People bringing out their resources to making sure people go out to register to vote, all of that work put in to make sure that there's no voter apathy. I think that you can point to the lack of voter apathy in this election, to the work that's, you know, the groundwork and all of that, uh, the, the, the work on all, all, all multimedia platforms that Labour Party has done. And I think that that is impressive. We need to applaud these people. Um, of course, this has brought forth reward. There has been an upward surge in number of voters. We can see that this is not an election that will be marred by voter apathy. And a large number of these voters are young people. Young people, this is the election. This is a very exciting election. There's a generational shift in this election, young people are going to be the major deciders of this election. And I think that young people have spoken loudly as to which candidate they support. Uh, unfortunately, you know, INEC did not really step up as we would expect. Um, there are lots of irregularities marrying the collection of PVCs. Many people going to collect their PVCs and hearing stories here and there. As of even up to yesterday, people said that when they got to... to, to to the ANEC offices to collect or the collection centers to collect their PVCs. They still heard stories. They still were being told that their PVCs are not ready on the last day. So at this point, those who are missing out have been disenfranchised by INEC, and it is such a shame. I think that we need to have a serious conversation as, as to how INEC dropped the ball in this election and did not step up with respect to PVC collection. Um, they didn't handle this well enough. And unfortunately, a lot of people are disenfranchised. Regardless, many people still got to collect their PVCs. Many people struggled for days to collect their PVCs, raised awareness. We did so much work on raising awareness, on pu pushing people to go to uh, collect their PVCs. And I, it has yielded results. We have seen a rise in collection of PVCs. We have seen a rise in, in voter registration, in young people registering to vote, even in rural areas everywhere. People have come out to register to vote. And on the 25th, people speak loudly with their votes. Okay. Uh, Ada in Joss. Good morning to you, ma'am. Good morning to your guests in the cattle. You are off air here now. We are on air. We are on okay, air. Your own end now. In your own end. We are live. Okay, end. okay. Yes. You are saying that you've no, lost. Yeah, 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 it's Lagos now. Hmm? Okay, please, please carry on. Pardon? Yes, uh, okay, now, Indy can uh, hear you. What, I can, and the viewers can. Yes, I hear. I learned that Indy Cattle is there. Okay, I'm very happy that in the country is honestly. What I want to say here is that I wish you put that Labour Party more close to their elbows, you know, Kayuri. When I watched what was happening, I mean, in recent times, you know, I was so shocked when I was really uh, uh, delighted or what, you know, when on one of the TV programs, somebody, you know, uh, one of the governors admitted on the other side, admitted that Labour Party would have a uh, 16... Uh, I mean, 25% uh, is 15 states. You can't believe it. I, I was really, I couldn't believe it, the way he said it. You know, because he was laying so much emphasis on no structures, no this, no that. And uh, the anchor was saying, if people, somebody who has no structure, according to you, no senator, no uh, I mean, uh, governor, this and that, and is making this impact, 16, uh, 25% in uh, 15 states, then what are you talking about? And, you know, you know, he, he just pushed outside his side that he, the, the presidential candidate is more like a Nollywood actor for them. That's by the side. All of that. Uh, oh, okay, um, Ada, th thank you very much. Uh, Indy, you heard Ada there, and um, you, you, you heard what she said. Uh, it, it, all, it, it reminds me of the fact that um, it's like uh, Labour doesn't have the complete uh, complement of candidates it's not everywhere, for instance, that uh, Labour has uh, senatorial candidates. Um, what, 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 how would you uh, speak, to, speak on that? How would you speak to that in terms of being ready? I mean, we're not the only party. We're not the only... 
We are not the only party that is going through that. I'm sure in some states, APC has also been dis uh, disqualified. PDP has its issues too. Some parties are still in the court, you know, so we're not the only ones. Um, what we have is a candidate again, you know, we had addressed this at the beginning of this show, that has name recognition and people are supporting fully. Now, I would say that this election is the people, the people versus the political class, and that's what we are seeing clearly. And the political class does not understand how elections will be, bo will be won without them. You know, they used to, uh, we are the ones who hold these people. We are the ones, you know, we are the super voters. We hold these voters on, in, the, in the palm of our hands. We get to dictate. And now they are seeing voters going the other way, and they, they can't seem to believe it. I think this was more believable um, in, in my place. Again, I'll give example with, with my place when we went for the town hall meeting in Southern Kaduna. And our elders, a lot of our elders couldn't believe what they were seeing. You know, people didn't have to be mobilized. They rushed to the hall. The whole place was flooding with people wanting to see the candidate, wanting to see Peter be engaged, Peter will be on issues. And that was when it dawned on them that, look, all the efforts and what they are putting towards, you know, trying to get uh, a certain situation, We'll, 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 go, we'll go a different way, we'll go in favor, we'll go in favor of Peter Obi because at this point people have decided and I think that this would be a new dawn for Nigerian politics where people, no one person can hold voters and say, you know what, because I'm governor, because I'm senator, everybody on that means is going to vote a certain way. People have woken up. These people have not been able to change our lives when we're suffering this bad. So we see no reason why, you know, a senator or, or a governor who cannot do anything for us during, during this NERA crisis, who cannot do anything for us during the fuel crisis, who has not been able to stop you know, the, the, the killings against us, will come and dictate who we vote for. Our vote is personal, and we're going to go and make that personal statement. And that's what is happening right now. It's the people versus the political class. Okay. Uh, Chris in London has called in. Good morning to you, Chris. That horrible sound indicates that I just lost Chris. Uh, Chris had called in from the UK. Uh, so sorry about that, Chris, that uh, the call dropped. Uh, but uh, I want to thank Ndikato for going, you know, wherever the conversation uh, does. Uh, we wanted to talk about the party's <laughs> grassroots project. And, you know, she started off telling us that even an app towards that purpose was launched uh, recently. And it's all about connecting people at different levels up and down the country. Uh, am I saying it right, Ndi? That that's what that app is all about once you download yes, of it. Course. How, how, how yes, does that of app course. work? Uh, you, what? You're supposed to get it at the Google Play. How does it work? How would it I work? I mean, you download it and you sign up and. Uh... You download it and you send it. I wish I could do a physical <laughs> work okay. for you, so but it's, it's, it's not possible it's, to do that. It's uh, like yes. a, a, a bit. It's a bit similar to being on a WhatsApp group, for example. Almost. Yes. You're yes. yes. You, you, you download yes. it, you sign up, and you find your community. Yes, you connect and you find your community up in there. And that, that's, uh, that's, that's about it. Um, I, I, wish, I wish I could show you. I, I, and you've spoken, on the but, fact, uh, yeah. you, you've spoken on the fact that your, that your adversaries uh, say that all these refined, uh, highfalutin things that they're, done, that they're doing, um, largely, the level of literacy and education in Nigeria, if you're going to make a wide uh, impact, uh, you've got to factor in the, you know, on, you know, the people who don't have uh, uh, internet, who are not sophisticated. That, that's oh, the app is not the only way. It's not the only way. They, I, of course, the app, the app is not the only way. So, you know, yes. It's we're just one of them. In every way. So we're just saying, look, for those, it's just one of them. For those who can, you can sign up here. But there's so I see. much more effort going up, uh, going on in the grassroots. That yes, many people are okay. doing whatever it is they I, can. This is just trying to gather as many people in one space as possible. But it's it's not the only way, please. I, I get you, Indy. Uh, Chris, thank you, Chris. Chris is back. Chris in London is back. What? Just as I was announcing him back, yeah, I heard yeah. that. <laughs> I heard that dropped call <laughs> sign again, uh, sound again. Oh, Chris. First of all, thank you. Thank you for making the effort. I don't know if you want to try again now that we're speaking. I'll tell you what, Chris, if you can try again, I'll interrupt myself mid-sentence. I'll even apologize to India and interrupt her too uh, so that uh, you can come in uh, from <laughs> London. You've been quite persistent. Uh, in the meanwhile, uh, Mazi Okoroafo is calling in from Arochuku. Good morning, Mazi. Good morning, Saju. Good morning, our guest. I want to sign up for our guest. Now Good morning. we have seen that United Nations report that out of school, Nigerians. Now, 
if let's say for example the party comes on board, how are you going to solve this issue as a house of school? Now that was the year report is as outstanding. But presently now, because of the uh, the redesign I ran with money, today in Nigeria, I have taken a statistic that in some houses where they have children that go to school from house, they students. They go to school on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, because their parents cannot afford transport money because of scarcity of food and redesign that note. So how would you handle that so if you are to be in government today? Good morning. Mazu Krapo is my name from Amish Minadia State. Thank you, Mazi Okorafo. Ndi, how, how, how would that work? Uh, in other words, what would be Peter Obi's and Peter, the Peter, Peter Dati team? What would be their approach to what seems to be as something of an, of an imbroglio uh, in this southeast right now? This is, I mean, it's disheartening to hear, to be honest. Let's keep campaigning aside. You can agree with me that hearing that kind of thing, I mean, it, it shook me hearing him say that. Um, but, you know, going back to what we'll do, in the first place, Peter will be campaign, or the, the Peter will be government, it's not going to bring in policies, you know. It's, we're, we're very focused on people-friendly policies. And policies like this are just against the people. Just to hear that children can't even go to school, like, hearing the, the effects of this narrow redesign policy is really sad. But, you know, in the first place, the first thing to do, and that, that's one thing that this government keeps doing, this government tends to throw up policies without thinking about how it's going to affect the Nigerian people, without thinking about this ripple effects. Look at what is happening in the Southeast and with this man saying, you know, children not being able to go to school. Look at the effects it's going to have on their learning. The government is not putting that into, I don't know if this government has any proper, you know, Could I interrupt teams, you briefly? Chris is back. On governance in this I, I, I beg your pardon. Indeed. Yeah. I really beg your pardon. Chris is back. Uh, good morning, Chris. Uh, yeah, good morning. Um, ah. What I just want to say is that um, um, Labour Party, it seems they are really pulling weight. Well, I just thank God the way it is going on because at least it will change the mindset of most of our old school, um, sorry for saying old school politicians, that even if Labour Party doesn't even enter, I pray they enter, but even if it doesn't enter, at least they've created a landmark in this type of um, election that anybody can come in to be the president, to be the governor, to put in their effort and make Nigeria better. Are you getting it? Yes, because we can hear you. Most of us, yeah, yeah. most of us who are in um, my friends who are in the UK, not that we are enjoying what is happening here. Friend, we are enjoying it to some extent, but the home, the real African home, we are really missing it. Oh, and the oh, basic oh. issue is just because of the situation in the country. Our leaders have really failed us. Like me, before I left Nigeria, I was jobless for about three years. Before I got the opportunity, the little opportunity I had to come here. And while I was in Nigeria, I've been to, we have about um, how many states we have? It's only two states I've not visited in, um, in um, Nigeria. Then when I was still working with um, MTN. And you see the, all the issues and here and there. When I was still there, we didn't have the issue of Boko Haram and every other thing. But a year later, while still working there, you find out that security was more. People are scared and we need more security. And the issue of data, once Labour Party enters, I want them to just do one thing. They should collect data. Because with data, a lot of jobs will be done. Like in the UK here, yeah, they have a, the data will show where and where one is. But in Nigeria, anything can happen. Fine, we have CCTV who can capture people, but how can they capture somebody who has stolen in uh, your state and is in uh, maybe Lagos state? It's not easy, but with the data that are available, you'll be able to capture things and things will be done. That's all right, all, 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 all right then. Uh, thank you very much, Chris, and again, thanks for your persistence. Uh, the third term, uh, the third time was a charm. Uh, thank you uh, very much. Uh, in the, he's saying, among other things, that um, the way he sees it, um, what Labour Party has done, uh, it's like we can't go back to, where, to, to how we were before in terms of uh, electioneering. He feels that a, a, a new watermark has been reached. Uh, what would be, go on, please react to him or respond to him. 
I mean, I, 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 I agree with him. I agree, I agree totally with him. Um, there has been a seismic shift in the way that electioneering happens in Nigeria. Elections have gone back to the issues. I always say this, and you know, at the risk of sounding like a broken record, if Peter Obi was not running by now, we would be discussing who went to London, who went to Dubai, who drinks the best pure water on the street, whose wife can fry a cara, and all of that. But you see that in this campaign season, people have had to come and defend their ideas. And politicians or candidates who cannot defend their ideas are finding that their campaigns are beginning to lag and take a back seat. And that is the kind of situation we want in Nigeria. And I'm glad that Peter Obi is doing that. If for nothing else, we have created a change just in the way elections happen in Nigeria and the way campaigning happens in Nigeria. And that kind of change that you know our campaign has been able to create, the Peter Obi's character, uh, uh, Peter Obi as a person, as a politician, as a, as a technocrat has been able to create is something that we are hoping to replicate in government. That this sense of seriousness is the same thing that we're going to translate when we get into government. And, and that's very important. Um, again, back to the, the issue with children uh, not, not being in school. Policies are supposed to, you know, when, when policies are being planned, we're supposed to look at a well-rounded manner in which, look, how does this affect the people? What will be the ripple effect of these policies? What's the end game of this policy before a policy is put into, is, is put into practice? Unfortunately, this government repeatedly fails to do that and ends up putting people in so much trouble. And then after people, putting people in trouble, when they come and attempt to fix their mess, any little, any little success they have at fixing the mess that they created, they celebrate it as, as if it is some big issue. And that is the same thing they are going to do here. The president has come to ask us to give him seven days, seven days of suffering, seven days of lagging. People have died because of this issue. It is a huge shame. And I just want to tell the caller that, please, when Peter Obi gets into government, this is not the kind of way any sensible government will conduct itself and will be no different. We will not operate in this way. We will operate like a sensible government. All policies must be people friendly. Well, I think that's a fine place to uh, leave it, Indy. I want to thank you very much. And I uh, wish you uh, the very best uh, as we approach the objective of all the political parties. Uh, Indy Kato, uh, spokesperson of the Obidati Presidential Campaign uh, Council uh, on our program from Abuja Studio. Uh, thank you very much once again, Indy.